So LDL serves an important function in our body. If we had no LDL, we would simply die. Uh, full stop. However, LDL can be damaged. And if that LDL becomes damaged, then we have a problem. And because what actually happens is that normally our LDL has a lifespan. Our liver excretes something called a lipoprotein. It's called a very low density lipoprotein. As that very low density lipoprotein, it's like a big boat and it's got triglycerides and cholesterol inside. So cholesterol is just a molecule. Cholesterol doesn't actually mean LDL. LDL is so much more complex than cholesterol. It's what we call a lipoprotein. It's a complex structure, but it carries some cholesterol inside. So this term to call LDL cholesterol is just frankly wrong. You know, otherwise, if, if a passenger was riding on a bus, you know, you, you don't call the bus the passenger. The bus is the bus. The passenger is just what's inside. So just because the bus is carrying somebody called Jeff inside, the bus's name isn't Jeff. You know, to give a bit of a silly example, but that's how silly it is. That's literally what they're saying. So this uh, VLDL molecule gets released from the liver and it deposits, it gives cholesterol to tissues around the body that need it. It gives triglycerides to where it needs to be for energy or for storage. And as it does so, it shrinks. And as it shrinks a little bit, it gets an arbitrary name change to intermediate density lipoprotein. And then as it donates a bit more of a cargo, it shrinks again. It's like a, a deflating balloon. Same, same particle, it just now has a different name, arbitrarily different name. And after it goes from intermediate density lipoprotein, it becomes a low density lipoprotein. And then this low density lipoprotein can be taken back up by the liver and the cycle continues. And this is important for life. And it's also got immune functioning roles and a bunch of other stuff. Now, if the LDL is damaged, the pathway by which the liver takes it back up out of circulation stops working. Basically, you've got one molecule on the outside of the LDL molecule that, or the particle that identifies it. It's called an ApoB100. That's the security swipe card. And if you damage that security swipe card, then you can't get taken out of, out of the blood by the liver, and then you start to accumulate. And one of the things that can damage this ApoB100 security swipe card is oxidative stress. So we actually know that it's oxidative stress that turns LDL bad. And if LDL is damaged, then it can accumulate inside the internal wall of the blood vessels. And interestingly enough, our old perspective, indeed my old perspective of how the LDL actually entered the wall, we used to think it would somehow diffuse across. Well, this looks like it's entirely false. Um, it actually looks like on the, if you've got a long blood vessel going down, you've got little small blood vessels coming in from the outside. They're called vasa vasorum. It's basically a tiny blood supply to the big blood vessel. And these LDL particles actually travel through these small blood vessels and they can lodge into the middle of the wall, what we call the intima. And that's where the, these fatty deposits form. But if your LDL is not oxidized, that process doesn't occur. And the interesting thing is, that a high triglyceride level and a low HDL level are really just markers of oxidative stress. It, that, that's a simple way to think about them. So if we just think about, you know, damaged LDL is what causes the deposition. And if you have a high triglyceride level and a low HDL level, then you're much more likely to have damaged LDL particles. And it really is that simple. And it's, this is well supported by evidence too. So everybody's worried that once you've got these fat deposits in the, the blood vessel wall, well, well, they must be there forever. Well, that's not true. We know that what we call plaque regression is possible. And in observational studies on plaque regression, they actually found that some people were able to get their plaques would actually disappear or they would actually shrink over time. And some people, their plaques would actually get worse. They'd actually increase or progress. And what they found was that those people who had plaque progression, on average, had LDL levels about 50% of those people who had plaque regression. Think about that for a second. We've actually got documented evidence in observational studies that it's possible to reverse these atherosclerotic plaques. And the people with the highest LDL levels are the ones who get reversal. 
the people with lower LDL levels actually have progression. And I don't know about you, but just that single observation should be enough to debunk this whole LDL myth that all LDL is bad. Yes, LDL can be bad, but only if it's oxidized. If you're otherwise metabolically healthy and it's not oxidized and it's not damaged, then you're going to be okay for the most part. Now, there are some things that we know that increase oxidative stress, and that's seed oils and too much sugar or too much carbohydrates. So we know that when the blood sugar levels are going up and down, we've got very good evidence that that generates oxidative stress. That generates these reactive oxygen species or these uh, electrons with an unbalanced valence shell electron that can actually damage other tissues. So you don't want your sugar to be going up and down every other moment. And the other thing is seed oils, by definition, they've got bonds that are prone to oxidation. And when you consume them, these oxidation products actually literally get taken up by these other particles called chylomicrons and get delivered to the liver. And we've got evidence, we can see this on electron microscopy, where these oxidized particles actually lead to damage of the liver, insulin resistance, and they actually then, through a whole series of downstream events, lead to your triglycerides going up and your HDL going down. So if you're worried about your LDL level, don't worry about saturated fat because saturated fat will make your LDL go high. Sure, it can do that, but it won't make it go bad. What will make your LDL go bad is having very unstable glucose levels and consuming a lot of oxidized seed oil. Paul, that was amazing. That was one of the most clearly articulated descriptions of uh, the LDL story. I want two follow-up questions. So obviously, I think when people go to their lipid panel, there's the LDL, HDL triglycerides, is there a simple clinical blood marker where you can measure this? Can, is there like an ox LDL that you can derive from a blood panel? So yes and no. You can actually measure LDL directly. So, and that's very easy. So when the LDL gets oxidized, these little surface proteins actually denature, they actually shrink, they change their structure. So if you damage an LDL particle, there's a tiny, tiny fractional shrinkage of it. And this is what we call small dense LDL. I'm sure you've heard the term. Now, this is actually a terrible term because we have people talking about these large fluffy molecules and small dense particles as if there's a significant size difference between them. It's infinitesimally small. It's a tiny size difference, but it is measurable. We can actually measure it. Japanese scientists way back in the 90s, they've actually figured out that when you actually have sugar binding to the LDL particle, it denatures these proteins and lead to a shrinkage. We've actually got evidence that glycation damage, as well as oxidation damage, leads to small, dense LDL. Now, we can put a sample of your LDL into a gel, and we can either centrifuge it, so spin it down, or we can apply a current through it so-called lipid electrophoresis. And both of those measures reliably separate out the LDL based on the density, the size of it, so either. And we can actually then see how many different LDL populations you have. Normally, you should only have one smooth peak, and that's, uh, that's basically healthy LDL, physiological LDL. That's not going to harm you, not in 100 years. That, that's good LDL. But if you start having it damaged, then you'll see more peaks. So the first step is you'll get a second peak. And my clinical experience is that when I correlate people with two peaks with something called a coronary artery calcium score, which is a direct measure of calcification inside the vessels that correlates very tightly with heart disease, that having a second peak doesn't seem to be overly problematic, but it's obviously not ideal. But once you start getting three peaks or four peaks or five peaks, then all bets are off then we start seeing significant uh, atherosclerotic burden. So you can actually directly measure this damage in your LDL by either one of those two methods. Having said that, this is not a simple blood test. Um, people don't generally do it. In Australia, it costs about $127, I think. So it, it's not over the top, but you know, it's, it's not free. If we have a look at triglyceride and HDL, though, we know there's this association with oxidative stress. And we've got very reliable associational data. It's not as good as directly measuring it, 
but we can infer with a high degree of reliability whether somebody has good or bad LDL simply by having a look at the ratio. And we do something called a triglyceride to HDL ratio. We divide the triglycerides by the amount of HDL. And depending on which part of the world you're in, because we use different units, we have slightly different thresholds. But basically, and I've actually got a couple of lectures online where I talk about this and talk about what thresholds are generally associated with what we call a pattern A, LDL pattern or a non-oxidized LDL. So yes, that's that's a pretty reliable test. That's, again, I'm just like connecting so many dots that I didn't realize were so th directly related because I know exactly what kind of like advanced lipid panel that lets you do the small dense LDLs. And I remember there's like a different segmentations and these exactly correlate to the curves in terms of the peaks of LDL. I just didn't, I just failed to realize that oxidative damage LDLs essentially small dense LDL particles, right? Like that's essentially the, the proposition here. And we can see it because it can be damaged in multiple ways. And so basically you can, you can see between one and five peaks if you actually do this uh, centrifugation or lipid electrophoresis. And I can tell you that if you've sort of, if you've got, you know, three, four or five peaks, then you better start on your wine cellar or you better do something about your health. Yeah. So for folks then, I'm just going down that path, you know, when people go on a ketogenic or low carb diet, oftentimes, or sometimes you see an elevation of LDL. So your response, your follow up to that is that actually do a more detailed LDL study to understand if that's just healthy, you know, happy LDL, or are you actually seeing elevation of small dense LDL? And you should be therapeutically concerned or clinically concerned if that small dense LDL rather than just generic LDL. Or have a look at your triglyceride and HDL level. And this is why this vegan study was so interesting. Systematic review of randomized controlled trials, because they found that the LDL level reduced, but because the triglycerides went up and the HDL also went down, we can infer that they had an increased unhealthy population of LDL at the same time that the LDL level was going down. You know, it's a real double whammy. They're getting the worst of both worlds there. Oh, wow. So, in, so they did see increase in small dense LDL as LDL went down in the vegan study. They didn't measure it, but we can infer that because we know there's a reliable connection between high triglycerides and low HDL and oxidized LDL. So almost certainly if they had have done lipid electrophoresis or centrifugation on their LDL particles, they would have seen the LDL population uh, was increasingly unhealthy and they were heading towards an LDL population that you do not want. 100%. And I would agree with that hypothesis. I'd love to see that study actually run so we can actually definitively say that that is causative. But I can also just, again, from a devil's advocate perspective, um, what would be the mechanism to, because again, HDL triglycerides associates to small, you know, poor ratio associates to small dense LDL elevation. What would be the described causative relationship versus just the observational associational relationship? Why does that uh, ratio drive small LDL? That, or small dense LDL, excuse me. The VLDL production from the liver is strongly associated with insulin resistance. And when we have oxidative, we, we, the liver is at the heart of this. If you have oxidative damage going to your liver, there's a reason that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and why we worry about liver enzymes so much. And there's a couple of pathways there. Uh, one which is sort of... Uh, has been talked about for a, probably a couple of decades now as retinol binding protein 4, and it seems to just link in the oxidative damage to some of the hepatocytes, and there's a whole enzymatic cascade, which I, I can't possibly pretend to fully understand. So it's more observational and associational data, but we have actually got cause and effect experiments where we can actually see if you create that oxidative stress, then you do get an increase in insulin resistance, and that then leads to an increase in triglycerides. Now, so we know this relationship to be true, but for me personally, I think we still need to tease out some of the uh, molecular details connecting steps to steps, but probably retinol binding protein four is certainly one of the key players. And then we have a, uh, there's a whole lot of other chemicals that are, that are involved there. And, uh, you know, guys like Ben Bickman are actively researching some of those at the moment. Got it. So essentially when you have insulin resistance, you have 
less efficient glucose uptake and in in, in 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 order to maintain energy balance you probably have a higher load of triglycerides to kind of capture that energy deficit so you have higher ambient triglycerides would be you know one way to kind of model out the system trying to balance itself yeah so i mean insulin resistance is as we know the heart of metabolic disease but i guess if we take that a step further then insulin resistance starts with problems in the liver got it 